uh, on behalf of Piki and Indian Chamber, it's a great honor to have Dr. Esther Duflo and Dr. Vijit Banerjee uh, come. The first question is obviously the negative, how bad things are going to be. Is there a possibility that like we are doing in education, your children are doing uh, school online and uh, you know, we are uh, talking about you know, some amount of telemedicine um, unless it's coronavirus, you know, you have to find other ways to, we are calling our, you know, physicians um, who we would normally meet. You know, many, other, many of the things, maybe the institutions of globalizing service working, you know, to become a service oriented economy from an industrialized economy. Is this going to, you know, push us and the governments can make the right investments to push us to that region. So those were two long questions uh, that I, yeah, I've been curious about uh, Maybe I'll take the, 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 first, uh, the uh, first crack as the first one. So in terms of the short-term effect, uh, my fear is that it's more likely to be 1929 than 2008 uh, in terms of the, the drop in the uh, world output. Uh, uh, 1929 was minus 15% global GDP? something between 15 and 20 percent and I think we are more likely to get there simply because currently half of the world is basically staying home. Uh, so on the other hand the 1929 crisis was induced by uh, real deep uh, dysfunctionment in the world, dysfunctioning in the world economy. Many things were not going well and in a way this was also a symptom of that at the same time as an actual crisis. This one is really without parallel in the sense that this is not, we've done nothing wrong as a, a capitalist society, I really disagree, we've done nothing wrong to make this. We've done many things wrong, but this is not because of the wrong things that we've done that this is happening. This is a really a shock coming from the outside. So I think the question mark is, if and when uh, we either have a treatment or a vaccine or for some uh, miraculous reason the, vac the, the virus actually uh, you know, goes away, do we then you know, put back the key and the machine and continue working just as before? Or the fact that have, the very fact that we kept the machine idle has it broken it? And I think that's going to be the answer to your question of how bad it is going to be in, uh, in, in comparison to the, um, to the 1929 crisis. And I think it depends, here it really depends on the willingness of governments to act now. Uh, and I think that relates to the second part of the question on supply and demand, which I'm going to let Abhijit answer and clear from that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess I'm, I disagree with Esther on the question of, I think we were going back to 2008-9 pretty fast actually anyway. be, before that. I think we were the, you know, this whole set of over leverage companies, India is of course the prime case of that, of, of uh, lots of bad debt. But I think the, U, the US was going into this, in this bifurcation of some a lot of companies sitting on cash and others becoming incredibly leveraged and that that process the deleveraging would have happened for other reasons as well so i, I think that I, I think it's going to be important that we are willing to and in a sense i will say that the supply this the fact that the there's been a, a massive demand shortage might be an opportunity in in for doing extremely uh, aggressive uh, quantitative easing. Just print money and give it away. I, right. My view is absolutely right. go long on money, uh, bail out while you are having it, bail out the banks when you use the cash to bail out the banks, give the cash to the people, do whatever you it takes. Uh, the, and if, if it generates a burst of inflation, so be it. It's, 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 the, it's a time to take risks and not to be uh, pusillanimous. And I think that this is so. I, I think it's it's a time to be aggressive about macro policy. I've been saying this for a while, and so I must be wrong because it doesn't seem to have penetrated many places. The U.S. actually is the one country which has gone extremely aggressively on quantitative. Europe a little less so. The U.S. 
has gone kind of very long on printing money. And I think that that's a, that actually shows good sense. I, I would say this is the time to, so in, in that sense, I feel that the one big mistake in 1929 was to keep the conservative macro policy in place for three years, basically. Till 32, 33, it's like uh, Hoover's macro policy is just stupid. And uh, I, I think that's, that's a key mistake we should not repeat. And in India, we have some worry that we're going just going to be too conservative at this point. We're going to be thinking of macro stability. There's no macro stability risk relative to the stability risk of a, a demand meltdown leading to a, to a complete collapse of the economy. There is, that's the biggest single risk. We should be risking inflation if the, you know, the currency depreciates. The currency could, you know, could depreciate because the, the supply side is not working. And so I think that having, having investments that actually make the supply side more live, like um, you know, getting the banking sector ready, this, this is a good time to actually be uh, free-handed free and just forget about the 3% monetary growth target or whatever, that kind of stuff is just completely not the right uh, moment to worry about. So that's sort of my, my sense is that we can actually avoid uh, 2000, uh, 1929, I think we can we can be more 2008-9 and be aggressive and just not do it as in 2008-9 to enrich the rich and nothing else. We can be much more mindful of the fact that this this 2009 was a was actually uh, policy wise it was a terrible set of choices made with the where. The, the CEOs of, uh, got paid enormous, that we should be very liberal, spend mo money, print money, give money to, to anybody who needs money, um, be generous about it, and uh, not worry about monetary policy targets. Use it to fix the, uh, the financial sector a bit in, in a country like India. Uh, I think all of those things are uh, kind of in principle to a uh, what about your second question was about uh, sort of more moving to a service oriented economy? Yeah, more structural changes in the economy. So uh, it's certainly uh, possible that, uh, in particular, firms will, will discover that you can do a number of things without people. And I think it was already going in this, in, in this direction. A lot of the technological progress that is coming out now is about, uh, is about replacing people by algorithm. And that's probably going to be, uh, uh, to be the, I, I assume there is going to be an acceleration in, in this trend, which is not necessarily a good thing because that means that once people are trying to go back to work, there might be many jobs that are just not, not there uh, permanently, not just because temporarily, but permanently because some solution has been found. To yeah, the, re the, the receptionist will no longer be necessary, nor will the mailroom, nor will the uh, the person who you know where you know kind of provides security. If all of us are at home, then we don't need anybody providing security at the w workplace. I'm, I, I'm actually very worried that the structural change that we were seeing will be accelerated exactly as you predict, and, but not necessarily for the good. I, I think that's something we need to be very mindful of. So, so being mindful about that means you know, accelerating the thinking about what we were already worried about when we were writing uh, Good Economics for Hard Time, which is how do you protect people from the shocks of uh, uh, you know, being of technology in this case, your job being replaced for whatever reason, uh, we are going to accelerate that because my sense is that first order, the, that's the, stru the structural change we are going to, we are going to see. Um, on the, the services, uh, in general, I think it's cutting a little bit both ways uh, because on the one hand, the service sector is the one that is really affected now. Anything that's peer-to-peer, -peer, restaurants, uh, um, tourism, etc., is the um, is going down, not up. Uh, that said, it is my my sense there is that people are going to learn that they really value those interactions, and that is something which I'm 
I, I imagine it's going to jump back up pretty quickly. Yes. I think everybody is going to be in the, the first day is lifted. A lot of people will be in restaurants. And getting a haircut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> including <Yes>. me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if suppose the government of India listened uh, to this advice and said, okay, we are spending 1% of GDP, we'll go up to 10% of GDP. What would be the instrument of doing that? You know, how would you spend that money, that additional 9% of GDP? So I think a big uh, chunk of that money should be direct transfer to people, and in particular, direct, direct transfer to the most vulnerable. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the infrastructure for doing that uh, is already, to some extent, in place. Uh, with the jam tr uh, trinity some this infrastructure is not complete uh, some people are left out of those pipes so it will take some effort just to do that so but i think putting some energy into putting money straight in the hands of the people would be my first and second and third priority the second one is to ensure that uh, uh, industries don't uh, uh, don't uh, uh, don't have to don't collapse so that means uh, um, uh, make, putting a moratorium on their uh, on, on their debt due on their debt payment. I think that's also in Europe. They, they, in many countries in Europe, including France, they have also basically taken over the payment of salaries while the lockdown is happening. And that, seem, that seems to me, if it's possible, a very good thing to do because it's, it really will inspire confidence if people can keep their jobs. Uh, I don't do you study uh, India in great detail? Do you think in the unorganized... Yeah, that is not possible. possible. Exactly. So in India, the, <laughs> the big catch in India is that that's not possible for a large fraction of the, for a large fraction of the, of the economy, which brings me back to my first point, which is direct cash transfer to the people with as little uh, loophole and uh, no, the opposite of loophole, as little hoops to jump through to get that happen where well, we have completely we have to in the current situation we have to completely revert our mindset usually the mindset of social protection is how can we make it as little possible make sure that people are not you know uh, undeserving poor people don't get it now we have to think the opposite problem what do we need to do to make it as inclusive as possible to reach people who generally are, are out uh, and we have a close uh, win, like a balcony seat on, on some of this uh, in, in some of the states where we work in where there is a lot of goodwill but uh, it's complicated so it is not an easy problem and it is one where uh, we need to jump and when one actually where business can help because in some in some ways the, the easier way easiest way to get people uh, might be through uh, airtime on their phones or uh, um, um, kind of creative solutions that the government has not come up with. That is absolutely essential because people need both the money to survive and therefore to not go out and, and defy the lockdown. And they need the money to continue to uh, purchase stuff such that the demand and supply shock don't snowball into some, some massive massive, uh, uh, basically, catastrophe that will stop the entire economy. You were asking earlier if we have a demand shock or a supply shock. There really is both. But the problem is also that they are building on each other. So the supply shock creates a demand shock because whoever was trying to produce this stuff is not doing it anymore, doesn't have a wage anymore, and therefore doesn't consume anymore. So you have this funny thing of a supply shock that actually has a Keynesian multiplier. And this is the time where getting money into the hands of consumers and making sure the business can stay afloat should be the twin priority. I mean, especially I would say, uh, you know, if I think people are both worried about the short run and the long run and getting people a sense that, okay, um, maybe not all of this money is, if people are given credible promises of money coming into their even. And I wouldn't say, so rather than saying, okay, we're going to get it to you today. I think people are also worried about the next six Absolutely. months, eight months. So they have some cash right now. So I think we shouldn't be absolutely like, it's not as important to be immediately get there at 
at all costs, uh, because I think we'll, then we'll just miss a lot of people, but to make sure that everybody has an assurance that money will come to them, which I think was important is it's okay if people have actually a bunch of cash and when this is lifted, they go out and spend it. I think the, especially poor people, what they buy has a pretty short supply response. The supply response, they're not buying things that are crafted over three, three years. They're, they're buying things that take three days to produce. So if, if business is ready, they can jump in. So I think the, the credit being available to business and not business has, you know, suffered a lot of losses to make those losses, uh, you know, so that the business is in a place poised to respond to the demand shock. But in principle, if there's a promise that the money will come and the money start, comes, that's, there will be a, dem a positive demand shock. And that might be the best way to do it rather than getting people to spend now. Because spending now has all kinds of health consequences we don't want. Right. Uh, right. So we want that maybe to postpone that process a little bit. By many, many factors. It's quite specific. Everybody models tools in different ways. And I, I think it's a little dangerous to overdo the democracy, non-democracy uh, uh, angle to it. Or is it uh, a discipline versus non-discipline angle? I would say competent versus non-competent yeah. at the top. I think it's much more related to who happens to be in charge and whether they understand what is going on. Uh, and, you know, nobody understands it fully, but they are, whether they are willing to, even, I uh, say, in the U.S., you take look at the U.S. states today. Some states have done much better than others. And it's really not Democrat state versus Republican state. It is whether they listen to expertise early and decided that they were not going to, the governors should not mix things up and they should listen to their, uh, to their advisors. And that is the difference between a state like uh, New York uh, or a city like New York, for example, and California. And those are both democratic states with very elite population. And you could do the same thing with comparing uh, uh, Ohio, uh, Ohio and, and Idaho. Louisiana. Uh, Ohio and Louisiana. So I think it is actually much more idiosyncratic than that. And, and one can never generalize from the China experience, you know, this government, uh, regardless of whether it's a democracy or a non-democracy, seem to be uh, explaining as well as how much the top of the government trust experts and then how much people trust the government. The gov if there was enough trust in the government, the government could, could have do done, it. done it. It can't do it precisely because people are suspicious, suspicious of, of the government. And one which I'll repeat and then I'll, I'll have him find, like pharmaceutical, <laughs> you are already in such a strong uh, comparative advantage in India to produce pharmaceutical. There is going to be uh, in the optimistic scenario, there is going to be such a need uh, to manufacture vaccines. And I think uh, even in our difficult world, I cannot believe there is not going to be international cooperation to manage the property rights. So that's going to be the golden age for uh, uh, generic manufacturing. So that's a big one. Oh, I, I, and in general, I think the investment, there's going to be massive investment in hospital capacity in rich countries. I'm guessing that Italy will buy a lot of ventilators after this year. And so anything uh, in that line of medical, of, equipment. Or medical equipment, you know, re-equipping um, smaller hospitals all over the all over the, the, the OECD. I think this is, this is going to be completely uh, happening. I think the political demand for, you know, not uh, saying that we don't have enough capacity, so we let some people die is going to be enormous. This one place where there'll be, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're right, left, or center, you're going to be under pressure to get in, invest in, in hospital infrastructure. So anything that you can think of that has to do with hosp making hospitals better place to take the next crisis is going to be critical, especially since some people are going to worry that this COVID will come back in the in the cold season again, like the 1918 uh, Spanish 19 Spanish flu, it came back. So I, I absolutely think that there will be anything in that range will have 
have a scope. I'm, I'm totally convinced that that's where the investment will be uh, made. A third, uh, a third uh, line uh, is uh, uh, as people have become used to do things remote, uh, there could be a new wave of the expansion of uh, um, offshore services that for where India is again already very strong and therefore poised to take advantage of even more offshoring of any number of things because uh, if Woodrow is right that we'll get used to doing some amount of things uh, uh, in two dimension rather than person to person, that is, some, that is something where, you know, India is like all ready to, uh, to move to. Uh, so that's, that's another one. Transfer to the most vulnerable that might be hard to get to. And those are, many of those are in the rural interland is what we, we need and some security in that's happening so that they don't actually ration their own food consumption uh, and they also continue to buy from the farmer. That's on the demand side. And then the problem with agriculture is the supply side. We can. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think that I, I will, with agriculture, uh, for the reason you mentioned, we really need to think about this, how to how to get these things harvested uh, and preserved, packed, uh, put put away. And in that sense, I think that if the government had to take one set of of proactive steps to open up the economy, I would have thought that given that the rabi harvest is coming up for harvesting uh, all over, uh, it would, it's critical that they, we have some guidelines on how to, how to do that and not let it go west. I, I absolutely think that that's where, if you had to, I had to think of one thing that's absolutely urgent to have a policy on, that okay, we were going to provide uh, whatever, um, uh, you know, masks and, you know, whatever, um, Safe, uh, safe environments. So we'll we'll put in, put in protections, and we'll have monitoring. Whatever it takes, I would say that's one of the places where the economic losses are absolutely mechanical. If the crop is not harvested, it will be wasted. Uh, and so I, I think that it is important that there is some uh, understanding of the that the lockdown has to be managed. Uh, well, the and again, going back to the rural sector, one thing that's very important to recognize that huge shock to the rural sector is the stop of construction. Construction is actually one of the ways in which the urban economy is connected to the rural economy. Huge shock to the, to the, to the rural consumers who, who live off money that their children make, their you know, family members make in cities, in construction, in working in, in you know, in tr 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 trucks and things like that. And that money is not flowing. So especially in the poorer states, in West Bengal, in Bihar, in Orissa, in, in UP, these are massive shocks. In, in West Bengal, I think, um, I think there is a, clearly a willingness to do um, a fair amount of information campaigns and get you know get people uh, to spread awareness. I think that's a that's that's a, a very positive thing. And I think the the more we are upfront about the dangers and be willing to tell people that you know you have to um, that it's it's really your uh, life and the life of your loved ones that are at stake. I think that's, that's critical that we, we deliver the message. So I think the messaging in West Bengal at some level has been good and I'm, I hope that it continues and becomes more, uh, I think the testing, the idea that now we're going to start testing uh, beyond the immediately infected people, that's I think a positive step and we should do